Is that the one I have to write? Good, so welcome everybody back to our course on compiler construction and uh, yeah, as promised and as announced uh, we have a guest lecture today, I'm very happy about this and our guest lecturer is uh, Oskar Nierstras. I think I don't have to introduce Oskar to our Bernese uh, students but for the students from Fribourg and Neuchâtel um, who do not know Oscar, he has been a professor at the University of Bern for 25, 25 years, <laughs> 28 years. So he was actually, not so long ago that um, Oscar was uh, responsible for all the software engineering and programming language teaching and research. So he was my predecessor at the University of Bern and um, well, I'm trying to teach you on compiler construction now since a couple of weeks, but if you, now you have a chance to talk to a real expert. So if you have difficult questions about all these parsing technologies, today is the day where you can ask them. Also about these language and grammar classes and uh, how they align to the real um, programming languages around there. Yeah, it's the last lecture on, um, on parser constructions. Uh, so you have learned already that there are diff different ways of how to construct a parser. Now you get another fresh look on how um, parser construction can be done. Um, but with this, I will not uh, steal your time, Oscar, and hand over to you for this lecture and hope that we all have some fun. Thanks very much, Timo, for the nice introduction. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually retired since uh, a little over a year, but retired is in quotation marks since I'm now working for a former student of mine at a very interesting little company called Think. And uh, they have a platform for software and data analysis and it includes a language workbench and I'll be showing you one of the two tools that uh, we use there. And uh, so let me just plow in here. So this is the course website and you'll find a link there to uh, the guest lecture page. And here you'll find all the material. So the lecture is broken up into two parts. The first part is regular slideware and you'll find a PDF link down there and also a link to the open source keynote not PowerPoint uh, slides, uh, and also the Java source examples. The second part of the presentation is going to be live demo, and if uh, we'll be downloading the platform from the company, Glamorous Toolkit, and we'll be running it directly from there. So everything from the lecture here is in the platform that you can download. So if you want to uh, also play along, then you can do that as well. And I encourage you to do that. Um, let me just go then straight to this slideware. So the first part of this uh, lecture I want to tell you about, so uh, the focus in the course so far has been mainly on uh, top-down parsing and you're doing exercise now with handwritten recursive descent parsers. Uh, but you've also learned a little bit about uh, table-driven bottom-up parsers. Uh, we have both of those in Glamorous Toolkit. I'm going to focus on the top-down one, which is super cool, but we also have a more traditional uh, um, uh, table-driven parser generator called SMAC, the Smalltalk Compiler Compiler. And both of these tools are, are uh, very high quality. But what I want to tell you about today are these, uh, this top-down approach. So this is something known as, um, actually there's a bunch of related technologies called PEGs, PACRATs, and parser combinators. And uh, PEGs are parsing expression grammars. Let me just dive in directly to, uh, so this is the outline. So part one, I'll try and stick roughly to the first 45 minutes. I'm gonna try and go a little bit fast, but I want you to interrupt me. So if there's something that you don't understand or something you find interesting, slow me down. Because I think a lot of the stuff is gonna be familiar to you, so you say, okay, yeah, we know that, we know that. But I don't know what you don't know exactly, so slow me down if you have any questions. I encourage you to be a little bit interactive. Yeah, so 
Parsing expression grammars, first of all, pack rat parsers and parser combinators. They're pretty closely related. Parsing expression grammars, basic idea is you have a DSL, a domain specific language, which looks exactly like a BNF, except it's a program and it's a parser. Packrat parsers, so these can be ambiguous and they may backtrack. The packrat parsers make the backtracking efficient with some caching, and I have an example of that. And I'm going to show you examples of both of those just written in Java without any special tools at all. Of course, tools exist, but just a handwritten peg and a handwritten packrat parser and just a few lines of Java, so this is easy to do. The code as well is linked from the page that you can find from the course website. And then parser combinators, uh, they basically turn a parser into an object and the operators uh, simply combine these. You can take two parsers together and put them together and get a new parser. And that's what we'll do in the second part where we'll implement a complete interpreter for SPL using uh, Petit Parser, which is a parser combinator framework in Smalltalk. Uh, here's some background links. Oh, by the way, as usual in the PDF, you'll find additional slides of notes, which are pointers to uh, a relate, related work and so on. So if you download the PDF, you'll find the extra explanations and so on. Okay, so when you design a language, you typically want to uh, formalize the syntax with the context-free grammar, uh, as Timo did for SPL. And then you typically write using, uh, you take this grammar and you feed it through a compiler compiler and it'll generate table-driven uh, LR parsers, bottom-up parsers. Uh, and then you have to hack on the grammar until you get it right. Because in order for the parsers to be efficient, they want to be able to look ahead just one symbol uh, so that they know what choice to make. Uh, otherwise, you, uh, and they typically don't support backtracking. Of course, there are versions which support uh, infinite backtracking, and we'll see that that can make your parser very inefficient. Uh, so usually what you try to do is you want to get a very efficient one, you try and turn it into a nice grammar, and the one you get for SPL is already a nice one, so you don't have to hack on it. And then you use the generated parser uh, to do what you like. I love this diagram. I was, for years, I struggled to try and understand what all these different language classes, and I stumbled across this. So there's a nice Wikipedia article as well. Uh, so all of this stuff, you know, comes from Chomsky. So Chomsky wanted to, uh, in the 1950s, he wanted, to, uh, he wanted to talk about languages as things that are uh, generated from description. And he had a whole bunch of different classes of uh, language descriptions, including the uh, unambiguous uh, context-free languages. And here are all the different classes and how they overlap. So the simplest ones, most languages are pretty nasty. In the last uh, uh, few months, we've been struggling with YAML. If you've ever heard of that, it's used as a configuration language. It is a nightmare to write a parser for that. I gave up and one of the experts in the company actually in a few days whipped up uh, a working parser. It was, it was beyond me. But this guy has 25, 30 years experience in the business and has built, he, he's one of the builders of Smack, so he knows this stuff. But you know, you have to be a real expert to write a parser for something like YAML. On the other hand, with SPL, it's, it's nice and tiny. In, in less than a day, with these tools, you can get a, a parser working. So some things are easy, and, and, but real languages tend to be very complex. Uh, I'm not going to talk more about that, but I just like the diagram. Now, if you look at context-free grammars and Chomsky, he uses this formalism of BNF to generate languages. What's a language in mathematics? It's a series of strings uh, which satisfy some properties. Well, so a context-free grammar, like a BNF, some, these rules, you have the left-hand side is a non-terminal, the right-hand side is a, is a series of terminals and non-terminals. That's the context-free. If you have a context-sensitive language, the left-hand side may have some context. But the left-hand side in a context-free grammar has, has no context. And what is it used for? It, it describes the whole language because you can generate all the strings of the language using that formalism. That's what it's for, that's where it came from. But what we want, we have a different problem. We're not Chomsky, we want to write compilers and interpreters for languages. So we want to recognize, we want to reverse engineer the structure. 
Um, so actually what we'd like to do is we'd like to use the same formalism for recognizing languages. So the proposal is to use a rule system to recognize language strings. And instead of taking the description of the grammar and generating a parser, you want the description to be the parser. And that's the idea of PEGs, parsing expression grammars. So they model recursive descent parsing. Of course, it's a completely different class of languages. You know, you have the LL and the LR. One is building bottom up, which is rightmost derivation, and the other is top down, and you're going from left to right. So that's the LL class, and they're different. So if you want to use one formalism or another, then you have to struggle with the fact that they're actually describing different classes of languages. Of course, you can fix that. But. So this is what we want. We want to use a similar description, and this is actually a peg here. Notice I didn't have an or bar, but I have a slash, and it's different. So it's, it's almost like BNF, and we'll see it in a moment, except that we have ordered choice. So the order is important. In BNF, the order isn't important. So this is first come, first serve. Is anybody programmed in Prolog? No? Okay, so Prolog is this rule-based system, and there's a very nice system called DFGs in Prolog that allow you to describe parsers in a way that's very similar to this, but it's also Prolog, you know, it's strictly order of the rules is important. So that means uh, your grammars specified with pegs are unambiguous, but the order is sensitive, so you may have to play with that. Okay. Pegs are nice, they're simple, the uh, way of expressing languages like context-free grammars. And they're close match to the syntax practices. They're more expressive formally than CFGs. Do you know what it means to be expressive? So you saw the diagram that we had. These languages are contained in each other. So if I have an LL1 grammars, they will generate certain sets of strings. But if I have an, something that's here, it cannot be described with that language. So LR0 is strictly more expressive. It can express, a capture a language, a set of strings that cannot be expressed. So these are contained in interesting ways. So to be more expressive means you can express things that cannot be captured. For example, uh, the context-free grammars cannot express a context-sensitive uh, language, and most languages are ultimately context-sensitive, but we handle that in a later phase in the semantic analysis. So they're more expressive. We have prioritized choice, which actually matches well to our programmatic uh, way of thinking, and we use these uh, syntactic predicates that we'll see shortly that can ask a question about what's coming next. So uh, things like expressing follow sets and so on, you can actually kind of express. You have unlimited look ahead and backtracking. And uh, you have linear time parsing if you use the pack rat parsers. So if you do the caching, as we'll see. The assumptions are that we're stateless. We only depend on the input string. And we make all decisions locally. Uh, for people who like mathematics, you can look at that slide later. It's actually pretty easy, but I'll just show you the uh, definition here. So there's not much here. It looks pretty much like BNF with some small differences. We have an empty string. We have a terminal, so we can match a string like foo or def or class. We have non-terminals like in BNF. We have a sequence of things. So we can have foo followed by bar. We have prioritized choice, so we can have foo followed by foo bar. And that'll never work because if we have foo bar as input, foo will match foo and the bar will never be matched. So we better do foo bar and then foo. Um, we have uh, repetition, so of optional, zero or more, one or more as before. And this is new, the syntactic predicates. These say, oh, and there's an E following, but don't consume, don't eat it. Oh, and there better not be an E following. So I want to match foo, and I don't want a bar afterward. But I'm not going to consume it. So that's a predicate. It just states something about what's in the input stream, but it doesn't consume anything. So that's different. So everything here is familiar, except prioritized choice is not the or bar. 
the order is important, and the syntactic predicates we haven't seen. And in practice, I didn't use those very much. I think there was just one case that we'll see later in SPL where that was handy for matching keywords. Uh, so here, suppose we have this rule. S wants to eat bad, so it'll match bad, baddest. It won't match A bad because there's an A in the beginning and it won't match babe. So they'll consume stuff, but they won't consume to the end. No surprises there. Prioritize choice, A or B, first try and parse A. If we succeed, great. If we fail somewhere along the line, we'll backtrack. Everything that, we cons that A consumed gets back in the input stream and we'll try again with B. So if we have if then else, then uh, if then S will be, that will be matched. This, so it, let's take this one. This one matches with the first rule easily. This, the first one here, it'll fail on the first choice because it won't find the else. Then it'll backtrack and then it'll match with the second choice. And this doesn't match at all. We'll get to the story of backtracking later with the pack rats. Naturally, when you try and write the grammars, either you can rely on backtracking and, and caching and so on, or you can try and rewrite your rules to reduce to a minimum uh, any backtracking. How would you rewrite this rule to eliminate any backtracking? Yeah? Right, so we would take this and factor it out into a separate rule, and then we say, oh, we recognize this, and let's see, is there an else afterwards? If there is, then we do this. If there isn't, we don't do that. But we never have to backtrack. With the pack rats, with the caching, we'll just cache this stuff up until a certain point, and then, well, we've already seen that before, and we can save some time. But you can also rewrite your grammar to try and elim eliminate the need for backtracking. Uh, yeah, these are obvious. E question mark, that's optional. E star is one or more, uh, zero or more. E plus is one or more. And uh, they're just syntactic sugar. So I think I don't need to dwell on that. Again, I'm gonna go fast because I'm assuming you've seen many of these things. But if something is, if there's a detail that you say, but what about that? You didn't say that. Please raise your hand and slow me down. Also, if any, do people on the stream, can they talk? They only listen. Oh, they only listen. So, <laughs> you're out of luck. Who's ever listening? These I mentioned, this is just repetition of what I said before, ampersand E says that succeeds when E does, but consumes no input, and bang E uh, succeeds when E fails, but it consumes no input. So foo ampersand bar will only match if we find a foo where there's a bar afterwards, but it won't consume the bar. And I'll use that in a little while, actually in the second part, uh, to recognize keywords in SPL, because we want to make sure that we match the keyword, but there's no other letters afterwards. So it's useful for that. Uh, oh, let me remember this slide. So this was an example with comments. Uh, right, so you want to have a comment start with slash star or slash star star, and we want to consume everything up to a star slash. Um, Right, so here we see the use of the, uh, of the predicate. So uh, something that's a comment that starts with a begin, a slash star star, then it has some internal stuff and then it has an end. What's internal stuff? Well, that's anything that doesn't already have an end in it and then continues with either another nested comment or some terminals and that continues on until we actually get the end. But notice the cool thing there is we separate comments from internals. So a comment could be nested inside another comment with a rule like this. 
which is not something you would normally see. And it works because we have the syntactic predicate that says this doesn't follow at a certain point. Let me see how much time. Good. For people who are interested in mathematical properties, I don't even remember this, it'll express everything that's in LRK. They're compositional, so they close under union, intersection, and complement. And we can express some uh, context-sensitive languages. So that's super cool. So this is an example of something you cannot express with the context-free grammar. Uh, a to the power n, b to the power n, c to the power. So I have n a's followed by n b's followed by n c's. And that's the language. All such strings. You cannot recognize that with, uh, uh, with a standard context-free grammar, but you can do it with, uh, with pegs, apparently. And though I don't remember how. I think I looked at that once. But, uh, but it's interesting. Some context-sensitive things you can capture. But not that I care at this moment. And yeah, decidability, uh, just from the specification of a language, you cannot know whether the specification has any uh, strings in it at all. So that's undecidable. What can we not express? Ambiguous languages. So by definition, because we have ordered prioritized choice, they are unambiguous. So uh, it's different from context-free grammars. Globally disambiguated languages, so that, some weird things like that. State or semantic dependent syntax is hard to do. I mean, typically this is stuff that you do in a later phase. After parsing, then you check whether the, uh, so I, I can syntactically check that Java code looks like Java code, but the grammar can't tell me what, that the variables inside the body are actually defined somewhere in the scope. That's not something that would be context sensitive. So you do that in a later phase. So that's normal. You can, of course, embed in the actions of your parser things that check some context sensitivity. So you can either try and do it in the parser or you try and do it in a later phase. I'll give you one example that was a bit of a nightmare. Uh, I said I was trying to figure out how to write a parser for YAML. YAML is one of these languages which is indentation sensitive. That turns out to be a nightmare because it's not context-free, really, because you have to keep track of where you are in the indentation. So that's context. Um, and the way to handle that is uh, you have additional rules, so you're not state-free. So the, you have a parser, but the parser is also keeping track of the state, what's our current indentation level, and so on. It's really kludgy and ugly. So I never realized that, I mean, Indentation sensitive languages are pretty to look at and they look nice and user friendly, but they're a nightmare for the compiler writer or the, or the, uh, or the parser, even if it's not an executable language like YAML. But Python and Haskell and ML are all indentation sensitive languages, so that's, that's difficult to handle. Okay, um, I'm plow ahead. So, if you have a predictive parser, you're using the techniques that you saw last week or the week before with the look ahead? Yeah. So you use the look ahead to decide which rule you're triggering, and it's fast and it's linear time. Backtracking parsers, like what you have in Prolog or with pegs, they try alternatives, and if they fail, they backtrack and try another alternative, which can be expensive. Uh, so it's simple and very expressive, it means that you have fewer constraints on designing your, uh, the specification of your parser and the grammar. It's very, very convenient. It makes your job much nicer. But it could be exponential time if you really messed up in the, uh, in the design of the, of the parser. Now I'll show you an example. So here's a tiny little language, an arithmetic uh, expression language. So I have addition and multiplication, uh, and I have uh, decimal numbers, just their digits from zero to nine. That's it, a tiny little language. And what I've done, without using any PEG framework, there are plenty of PEG frameworks that exist for Java and other languages. What I did instead is I wrote a top-down parser by hand in Java. Uh, the link is also on the same page uh, if you want to try it out. 
And let's see. Oh, why do you insist? Here we go. So here's the. Hello. Okay, it's fine. Here's a simple parser. I have some input string that I would like to parse. And uh, wait a moment, I'm gonna dump, jump back and forth between the slides. So let me just stick with the slides for the moment because I've selected stuff that I wanna show you. Um, so I have a parser and it, it wants to return a result. So that's a, a nested class, um, an inner class. So the number is the result that's calculated so far. And I have a failure, an exception, uh, that may be raised. And that happens if parsing fails at some point. Now what I do is I write all my rules like this. Uh, if I have an alternative. So here I want to notice I'm, I don't have the nice syntactic overloading that we have uh, I don't have the DSL, but we'll have a DSL in a few minutes when we switch to, to Smalltalk. So here I'm just implementing uh, the pegs in Java directly. But you can do the same, you can overload the syntax in other languages like C++ or Python, so you can get the same expressive power. But here is uh, an alternative choice being expressed. So this is the add rule. I have a multiplication plus an addition or a multiplication. So here, I try and match the multiplication, and then I try and eat the plus, and then I try and match the add. And if I succeed, then I'll return the result. And the result, I'm actually gonna compute the result, so my parser is an interpreter, and it'll evaluate and return the results. If anywhere in here we fail, we backtrack, and we try the alternative rule. Of course, this could fail, but I have no further alternatives and the whole thing is nested. So the whole thing, is a few lines of code. And I think I can run this guy here. And what I did is I decorated this with, with uh, some, uh, some logging to show what's happening. So here we see all the steps. So this is what I'm matching. Oh, this failed, I backtrack and so on. And at the end, I've computed two times three plus four is 14 in 304 steps. So pretty efficient, right? <laughs> and lots of backtracking. Lots of backtracking because, yeah, well, multiplication plus addition or multiplication, the multiplication, I have to do that twice. A primitive times a multiplication or a primitive, I'll have to do the primitive twice. So these things have to be done over and over again. Whenever somebody tells me they've optimized a program, I ask them, well, what did you do exactly? And here's a lesson, a computer science lesson. 50% of the time or more, optimizing programs means adding caches. So you have to profile the program, figure out where you're spending time. Oh, I'm calculating things twice. Let's cache that value. I had an experience some um, 10 years ago. I was visiting a lab, uh, the uh, lab of Jürgen Vinschu and Paul Klint in Amsterdam, uh, where they were doing similar things as we, and I wanted to try their platform for software analysis. And I was trying to write a translator between uh, code in their platform and ours and learning their platform, and finally I got something working that was analyzing this, their software, using their software, uh, which was fairly large, and I said, okay, I've got this working now, but it's pretty slow, it's taking 20 minutes to run. Um, and they said, okay, now we'll show you our, uh, our uh, memoization uh, approach. So they showed, us how, showed me how to do the profiling, and I found using their, and how to do the caching. So basically, I could just with an annotation say, oh, whenever I compute this value, cache it, so to remember it for the next time. And I found with the profiling and maybe an hour's work, uh, five to 10 places where I could cache stuff. Then I ran the whole thing again. From 20 minutes, it was down to two minutes. Uh, that's, so remember. <laughs> If you want to do cheap uh, optimization, very often uh, caching will get you a long way. So that's what we do here. 
So this was the parsing of six times three plus four. Um, so memorized parsing is pack rat parsers. They squirrel away the results intermediately. And basically this is all that we do here. So, well that's stupid. So when I'm in presentation mode, I can't highlight things with the mouse, okay. <laughs> um, so here in the uh, sort of, in the memoized, I have a subclass and all that happens in the subclass is when I compute something, then I store it in, in a hash table. So we can see that in the, uh, in the code here. Here's the pack rat parser. Just a few lines of extra code to do the, to, to store the intermediate results. And when we run this, we get the same result, but in uh, one sixth of the number of steps. So here we can also see where we're backtracking and we retrieve the hashed results. Um, actually showed these lecture notes to Lucas Rengli, who was uh, the guy who implemented the first version of Petit Parser 2. And he said, yeah, the memoization nowadays, I tend to try and rewrite the grammar so I don't have to backtrack as much. So it's nice to know this, and it's a good lesson to learn also in other, it's a general computer science and programming lesson to learn. I don't necessarily want to sell pack rat parsers. Sometimes it's, it can be useful, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. So if while you're doing the exercise, you find that you're doing backtracking in your recursive descent parser, you might consider using memoization if you have a performance problem. Uh, yeah, so this definitely reduces the, the length of time. So the pack rat parsing has linear cost. It actually recognizes a class of language larger than deterministic parsing algorithms. And uh, pack rat parsing, but also pegs in general, are good for scannerless parsing. Now, what does that mean? So typically, so what you've seen up until now, if you write a, a compiler, if you write a parser, you separate lexical analysis from the parsing. So you first recognize lexemes using regular languages, and then you use the full power of uh, context-free grammars to specify the structure. So you first recognize locally all of these little bits and pieces, and then you try and discover the, the, uh, the overall structure. Why is that a good thing to do? Because regular expressions are equivalent to state machines. They're fast. You can compute that part fast. On the other hand, regular languages are strictly a subset of context-free languages. So you could use BNFs or whatever to do the lexical part as well. If you do that, then you have a scannerless parser. Why would you want to do that? What's a good use case? Yes. Hmm? Yeah, but for what kind of languages would a scannerless parser be really super useful? Remember, if you separate the scanner and the parser, you have one set of lexemes that you're stuck with for the whole program. One set of tokens. Yeah? Yeah, but there's a, a use case where if you have the traditional approach, you're in a real bind and it's more increasingly common. Yeah? It's not about the grammars, it's about the languages. Okay, I'll tell you, embedded languages. If I have one language embedded inside another, I have SQL embedded inside Java, or some other query language or DSL. Normally what I have to do is I have to put it in a string. So it's recognized as one lexeme and then I use another parser to parse that. But if I have a scannerless parser, 
the scandalous parser says, okay, now I'm in the Java scope. Oh, I've entered the SQL scope. And now I switch to a completely different set of lexemes. I parse that. Uh, and then I say, oh, here's the end of the SQL part. I'm back to Java. You can pop in and out of languages with the scandalous, uh, uh, scandalous parser. So that's super interesting. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds really easy. <laughs> yeah, you probably have to do something weird. So you'd have to have the parser calling the lexer, and then it recognizes, oh, I better call it. Yeah, but that's essentially what you're doing here. Because I hit a certain context and say, oh, here I have a different part of the grammar. So that part of the grammar. So yeah, maybe you could do that as well. But it's super convenient this way, because then you, instead of having, I mean, it's all within one formalism. And we'll see that in the SPL implementation. We don't have any embedded languages, but you'll see that the, we use the same formalism for the tokens as for the, for the structure. Uh, yeah, 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 unified grammar for, okay. For people, so lots of bullet points here. Let's skip. What's it not good for? So, uh, have you talked about generalized uh, context-free grammars, generalized LR and LL and so on? So there's this class of languages that uh, what they do is they actually spawn multiple parsers when they can't figure out, let's parse this way if it's ambiguous. Let's try all paths instead of the first one and then pick the one that we like the best. So these generalized, there are generalized LL parsers and then generalized LR parsers and then more recently other classes. So those are kind of weird. These are strictly, the pegs are strictly one choice, the first result. Um, yeah, anything that has stateful syntax, what's the meaning of this depends on where you are. The same token may appear in, in completely different contexts. So if you just look at it locally, I have no idea what this is. I have to see more context before. Oh yeah, that's a function call or, and not a definition of, or, and not an array or something because in C and C++ you can have these weird situations. Again, there's a question, if you can't do it in the parser, you do it in a later phase. You just lump them together and then later you figure out what it was. Um, yeah. The parsing in minimal space, yeah. So how quickly things grow. Okay, let's see where we are. Oh, good, just a few minutes left for the parser combinators. Let me start introducing that. So the parser combinators are essentially the same idea, except instead of before where we had in the, in the Java code, it was just Java code. I didn't have composable parsers. And then the pegs that we saw, they were just expressions. Well, what if those pieces, instead of being uh, code, they were actual objects or functions? So parser combinators in functional languages are higher order functions, and in an object-oriented language, they're objects. So when I say, um, when I have a rule like this one, mul plus add times mul, uh, or mul, add and mul, they're objects, and the plus is an operator that's applied to them. So I take one parser and another parser, and I add them together, and I get a new parser. And I have the or bar uh, composed with mul, and I'm actually composing these things. Every bit is a parser. And that's exactly what we'll have in um, Petit Parser. So Petit Parser is a peg parser combinator library for small talk. It was originally implemented by Lucas Rengli in 2008 or something. It was part of his PhD thesis, or was it a little bit later? So he needed it for a language workbench that he was building called Helvetia. And uh, it actually ended up being very useful on its own. A lot of people got uh, very interested in it. Uh, and then it was ported to many other languages excuse me, many other languages. So you'll find Petit Parser implementations for a variety of languages. And basically you have a hierarchy of different kinds of object types or parser types. 
uh, you have the sequence and choice and 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 not and so on. All of these are different kinds of parsers and you have operators that will compose them and give you new parsers. Um, here's an example. So this example of the um, little language that we had before. Here I've written it as a script. And because it's a script and because it's recursive, I have a little problem. So there's a tiny little hack here. I define the objects mul, add, and prime as empty objects. So the unresolved node, so it's, it's, it's nothing. But then later I'll redefine it. So uh, decimal is a digit as parser. So I send the symbol digit, hey, be a parser. I could also say to the string foo, hey, string foo, be a parser. And that's a factory method that will create a parser from that. Here there's a symbol digit and I say to the symbol digit, hey, be a parser. And that'll then turn into a parser that recognizes zero, one, up to nine. Then I want to redefine add. Add is going to be mul plus add plus mul. You see, this is where the recursion comes in. I needed add to be already defined before I used it. So that's why I have uh, it as a, a placeholder value. And I simply say, oh, it's mul followed by plus as parser. Dollar sign is the symbol in small talk. So I say to the symbol plus, hey, turn into a parser that will recognize the character plus. And then followed by add. So this is sequence. So comma here is the sequence operator. So I get a sequence of parsers. They're composed. They give me a new parser. Prioritized choice, that's an operator composed with mul, which I already have, although it's not completely defined. And now I have redefined add as a composition of one, two, three, four parsers. Well, two of them are the same and one is itself. And do the same thing with mul and prim and so on. Finally, I say my goal is to match add and then I don't want to match anything else. So end is a special operator that says match the end of input. Because remember, if we match foo, we'll succeed, but there may be more stuff in the input stream. So now if I say go parse this, then I'll get this gobbledygook out. So this is what's matched as a nested array. So it's a, a syntax tree, essentially. We haven't seen any actions yet. Now we can add semantic actions. And again, this is just an operator. So these are objects composed with blocks. So with the double arrow, that takes a parser and adds to it an action. So the decimal is gonna take the parser that will parse and recognize a single digit. And I take a block, so this is a lambda essentially. So Square brackets is like lambda, colon node is the argument, and the or bar after the or bar is the body of the lambda. So it'll take the node, the thing that we matched, and it'll turn it into a string, and take that string and turn it into a number. So now instead of getting a, an AST back, we'll get a number back. The add will notice that we can uh, put actions on subparsers as well. So here, when I compose the multiplication parser and the add parser and the plus parser and the add parser, then I just add an action for that part, not for the whole thing. And that tree, I want to take the match the first part and the third part, and I don't care about the plus, I throw that away. And I'll take those two and I'll just add them. So that's a real plus uh, for addition for numbers. And the same thing for multiplication, I actually do the multiplication and uh, here are the primitives. I just, if I, have a, uh, uh, if I have a parenthesized expression, I throw away the parentheses and I just extract the, uh, uh, extract the second value there. And now when I apply the parser, I'll get 42 out. So that's the complete implementation of that as a script. Scripts are nice. But what I actually want to do is I want to turn it into a class. So actually there's a cool thing we'll see later. I can take that script and I have a refactoring tool. Two members of the Fink company that I'm working for are the people who implemented the 
uh, Smack compiler compiler, but they're also the people who implemented the very first refactoring browser in the mid 1990s. So they are the experts in refactoring, the first people who popularized refactoring before it came into Eclipse and other platforms. Uh, and anyway, what they did is we have a refactoring which will take that script and turn it automatically into a class. Basically what happens is every rule, every parser turns into a method uh, whose value is cached in a slot. Um, so each of these are methods in Smalltalk syntax. Uh, each of these is a full blown parser. And the one that we want in the end is the goal parser, which is the composition of all the parts. And we'll see that in action in a little bit, so don't worry about that too much now. There are numerous implementations of Petit Parser. If you go to the Petit Parser website, pityparser.github.io, you'll find links to implementations in multiple languages. I don't know how up to date this is. Lucas told me that the, there's a lot of activity on the Dart implementation nowadays. Uh, he works for Google in Zurich. Uh, since many years, and uh, there are implementations in other languages. The version that we'll be using in Smalltalk is the one that was re-implemented a few years later by Jan Kursch, a later PhD student of mine uh, who was working on so-called island grammars, uh, a tool that you use if you want to only recognize a part of a big program, if you want to pull parts out. So he took Petit Parser and extended it with a few more operators, but he ended up re-implementing it in, uh, uh, in, um, in many ways. So it's, it's the standard implementation now, and it's part of the platform that, uh, that we're using. That's everything I wanted to show you in the first part, and in the second part, we'll be looking at a live demo of uh, implementing the SPL using Petit Parser. So if anybody wants to have a chat with me in the meantime, I'm here before my, I'm no longer used to lecturing, my voice is wearing out. Oh, and as usual, we have a few questions for you at the end. Okay, thanks. I'll continue then at a quarter past.